Rachel K. Albers is an author and brand strategist slash mastermind who had a really great book idea that she was shopping around to a few big five publishers. In case you don't know who those are, that's of course Penguin Random House, Macmillan, HarperCollins, Simon & Schuster, and Hachette. She had this great idea for a book that she was shopping around to all these different publishers and they rejected her, ironically, because she didn't have enough followers. Now, why was this ironic? It was ironic because she had an idea for a book all about the age of personal brand and its effects on humanity. Now, what's really interesting is I went to her website and I actually subscribed to her newsletter because I thought she had a really cool brand, so she knows what she's talking about. I looked on her website and according to the footer, she had seven different profiles that she was available on. After doing a little bit of quick math, I tallied up all of her followers and she has over 20,000 and that's considered not enough. Now, what point am I making with a little opening story like this? Well, if you have a really good idea, it's no longer just about the creative merit behind that idea. You now have to be an entrepreneur, meaning you not only have to have an idea, but you also have to have a big following and know how to market yourself really well and do all of those things simultaneously really well. In today's video, I thought we could cover an article that I recently came across that was really, really interesting on Vox called Everyone's a Sellout Now, written by Rebecca Jennings. She comments on culture and the creator economy type stuff on Vox. And it was a longer article, but I really enjoyed it. So it's linked down below in case you wanna read it. But I just thought this was a more serious topic that deserved to have a little more of a platform, a little more time and attention to it. So I'll be very, very curious to hear your thoughts after this video. So be sure to stick around so we can have a good little discussion going afterwards. Let's get right into it. Let's break this down and talk about how the internet changed the digital landscape that we now know as this creator economy, this attention economy, this new economy, if you will. Now, I'm going to borrow some words from Chuck Klosterman, who kind of describes in his words what a sellout is. And he describes this in an essay collection from a while ago that he wrote called The 90s. Now, he describes a sellout in this book or in this essay collection as not someone who sells something in order to get rich, but someone who compromises their values to do so. Now, it's really interesting because if we take a step back and kind of orient ourselves in the period of the 90s, right? Because that's what his essay collection was called. The 90s was an era where trying too hard or caring enough was not just seen as uncool, but also embarrassing. And being a sellout was considered like the ultimate sin, right? This is where a lot of like punk was the thing, right? You weren't punk if you cared too much. And I really like the way that he frames it with this quote where he says that being a sellout, right? It's a loser's game and everyone knew it, but it was a loser's game you still had to play, right? And this is, I, I feel like this quote has aged so well because it only gets more and more relevant the more intrinsic and the more detailed and the more smarter, really, our technology gets. Before the internet, it was common for artists' companies to not let them worry about the money. That was not something that they needed to concern themselves with. And nowadays, it is no surprise that with any creative pursuit, especially being an author, because that's mostly what I talk about is the business of books, it's no secret that you can't live off royalties anymore, like the greats. I'm not sure what the music business is like. I'm not sure what the arts business is like, but I know with books at least, it is a huge dream for a lot of people to become this amazing popular franchise author. You live off your royalties, maybe it's another stream of passive income for you, and that's just no longer the case. Unless you are willing to pour yourself into marketing and promotion, which is a big part of this conversation that we're gonna be getting into. Nowadays, if we fast forward to the 2020s especially, nowadays, every person online with an account is not only an artist or an author, but they're also a publisher. They're publishing content, whether that be books, whether that be music, whether that be art, whether that be animation, whether that be whatever. You're not only an artist and a publisher, but now combining both of those things and managing that account, you are now your own business manager. And I've said this before, in plenty of videos in the past, but when you decide to write a book especially, but also pursue any kind of creative endeavor, you're going into business with yourself. You are becoming an entrepreneur, baby. If you want to reach the most amount of people in the shortest amount of time, it is no surprise that TikTok is where a lot of that action happens. And the pandemic only accelerated its growth, right? Book talk is a huge thing, you know, on TikTok. Everything happens on TikTok. TikTok is like the ultimate platform. I'm not on TikTok. I know people keep telling me I should get on there, but I, I kind of don't really want to. But anyway, if you want to reach the most amount of people in the least amount of time with the least 
least amount of effort, TikTok is a really, really great way to do that. It's also kind of your only option. And I'm gonna borrow a quote here from a music artist called Rick Montgomery. He got a music deal from a video that went viral. He's got like 2 million TikTok followers. He says that if you have absolutely no knowledge of video creation, right, being in this creator economy, good effing luck. <laughs> and I have to admire his candor and, and just his just pure transparency. I absolutely love that quality in a person. Traditionally, like traditional PR, right? If we're talking about attention, putting attention on people. Traditionally, this is what PR was for, right? Public relations, a positive review on the New York Times or a slot on Good Morning America used to turn someone into an overnight success. And nowadays it doesn't even make a dent. It really doesn't even matter because you know why? A lot of older, a bit of an older demographic tends to care about that type of outlet because I don't know, maybe that's something that they grew up with. They're more familiar with it. I don't know. But nowadays it's all about YouTubers and especially influencers. It's about brand deals. It's about sponsorships. You are kind of your own entrepreneur and it's way easier to trust the word of an individual who happens to be a brand versus a brand that has no individuality to it. So as a replacement to these traditional PR methods, I'm going to be borrowing some words from Israel Deramola. I hope I said his name correctly. He's a writer at Defector, which is a sports blog and media company. He says that instead, we now have a loose collection of YouTubers and influencers who feed slop to their younger audiences. Now, I don't know if you agree with that phrase or not, but I'm putting it out there because I do find it really, really interesting. And what do we get as a result? A mass of fans who might not know quality when they see it. If they're told something that they like is not quality or is slop, in Israel's words, it's very easy to get offended at. I mean, it hurts being told that the things that you might like kind of suck, but I've said this before, just my own personal opinion, it's just, I'm just bored right now. Like everything is algorithmic, everything is a pattern. We're just working off of things that have worked in the past, especially when it comes to movies. Everything's a prequel, everything's a sequel, everything's a remake. We're just working off of stuff that has historically worked well because it's it's really hard to take risks nowadays because these big media conglomerates or publishers or whatever, they want to make money off of a safe bet and not lose as much as they could. And a lot of these media companies, like you don't have DVD sales to rely on anymore. Everything is streamed. Everything is so instant that there's such little room for error. There's, there's just not as much room for monetary failure. And this is kind of a good segue into the next section that I want to talk about, which is the disappearance of artistic independence, right? Social media has become essential in order for anyone to stand out, but especially artists, right? You spend more time arguably promoting your content than maybe you do actually making it. Because everything is so streamed nowadays, all this corporate consolidation, all of these streaming services have, you could say, depleted artists' traditional sources of revenue and, in the words of this article, decimated cultural industries. It's not really common to live off of your royalties anymore. It's maybe gas money. It's maybe a little bit of grocery money. It's, it's really kind of sad. It's really kind of unfortunate that you've just commodified the arts so much that it's more about the entertainment of it rather than the value of it. And if you're doing this constant self-promotion, right? And in this case, it being more about quantity than it is about quality, you have to have a sustainable enough promotional model, especially if it all lands on you as an artist, as, as an author, as an authorpreneur, whatever, you kind of do have to resort to these cheap trends, right? To just ride the wave and hope that something catches, right? It's all about working smarter, not harder. Does that mean it's good? Does that mean it's bad? I don't know. Sometimes it is good. Sometimes it isn't so good. But this is where it kind of boils down to the tyranny of algorithmic distribution, right? Where nowadays you have to appeal to the algorithm to rise to the top so that someone else at the top can catapult you even further, right? It's sort of funny. I mean, nowadays it's becoming, it's gradually becoming more common, at least in the book space, to go viral on social media, have a huge slew of sales, enough to catch the attention of an agent who maybe pitches you to Penguin Random House, who then traditionally distributes you and represents you, right? I mean, that's, it's, they're, everyone's playing it safe, right? And because everyone is their own PR agent, their own business and brand manager, 
we have now entered into the new economy, the attention economy, the creator economy, whatever you want to call it, where if you're not building your own brand, you're already behind. And there was a uh, article that was headlined in this business magazine called Fast Company that says career success is no longer defined by moving up the corporate ladder, but by individual growth and self-promotion, which I feel like is a very succinct way of kind of describing what this new economy is, right? It's not just about appealing to the man, whether it be your boss, whether it be your manager, your director, whatever. It's now about, it's very self-oriented, right? You have to find a way to get yourself from A to B knowing what you know and do it all very, very well at the same time, right? Having a good idea, having a good brand, having a good marketing platform and doing it all at once and giving yourself over to it completely so that you can appeal to the algorithm and build a following. And that's the thing. This is a quote that I'm also gonna borrow. It says, hardly anyone wants to build a platform. We just wanna have one. Brooke Aaron Duffy, who is a communications professor at Cornell University, also describes this new economy really well. And I think I prefer her description a little bit more. But the way that, you, that we can kind of summarize it is, how am I going to engage in self-branding to monetize whatever my field of expertise is, whether that's books, whether that's music, whether that's art, whether that's photography, I don't know, whatever it is. And it seems like the people who rise to the top are the people who look just like everyone else who's at the top. I don't feel like you see much diversity when it comes to influencers, when it comes to TikTok stars, when it comes to, I don't know, these big influencer creator type people. These often tend to be people that society already rewards, which is young, wealthy, pretty people filming themselves being young, wealthy, and pretty. Art has inherently become an entrepreneurial pursuit. That's no surprise. I've already kind of mentioned that. But you've got to, in the words of this article, you've got to offer your content to the hellish, overstuffed, harassment-laden, uber-competitive attention economy because otherwise no one will know who you are. And that is kind of a bit of a scary thing to think about. If you're not doing your best, if you're not at the top, you're a nobody. Have you ever seen that movie Shark Tale? You know, where Will Smith playing the little fish is like looking up at the really tall building and he's like, ooh, I wanna be a somebody. And then Angelica or whatever her name is, Angela is like, oh, you're already a somebody to me. It's it's really no different than Shark Tale. It, 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 I see a lot of similarities myself. And it does make me wonder that, you know, people who pursue this online stardom, whether it be to get someone else's attention, whether it be to build their own following or a combination of both, it does make me wonder how much of this appeals to people who maybe have some kind of hole or gap inside of themselves, something that they're not comfortable about with themselves, something that, you know, oh, if I just get this, then I'll be happy, right? I mean, this this is kind of starting to get into a whole other type of territory, but as the daughter of a therapist, it's easy for me to want to psychoanalyze people. So it just makes me kind of wonder, you know, how much of this is about the art and how much of this is maybe also about feeling something inside of you, right? Everyone wants to be seen. Everyone wants to be valued. Everyone wants to be heard. Everyone wants to be acknowledged. And it's like, if you're not at the top, then it's not worth it. It's Talladega Nights. If you're not first, you're last. So what does this contribute to? What does this look like? This, this looks like burnout. This looks like overexposure. This looks like comparison. This looks like obsession. And a lot of these things go very, very hand in hand, unfortunately. And while there is no perfect solution to such a big challenge like this, if you wanna see it as a challenge or if you wanna see it as an exciting new business opportunity, you can look at it either way really, but there is no perfect approach to something like this that combats this new economy, that combats this burnout, this overexposure, all this stuff. But there are small steps that we can take and I have a few of them to offer. They're not perfect, but it's what I'm able to offer right now. The first one being valuing engagement over vanity. And what I mean by that is I'm someone who looks pretty deeply into analytics and data and metrics for not only my marketing efforts, but also other people that I do work for, that I do digital marketing work for. And this looks like view counts, right? Versus an open rate for a newsletter, right? It's important to look at metrics that actually tell you something, that, that give you some kind of actionable idea of what you should be doing. Here's what's working, here's why it's working. We should probably do more of that versus views, right? View count is very superficial. It's a very, very easy metric to wanna get sucked into. Ooh, my video got a thousand views. My video got 800 million views. Why? 
What did they like about it? What drew them into it? What parts did they engage with? What parts of the video did they not engage with? Something as superficial as a view count is, it's an ego stroke. It's a vanity metric, which is why I say engagement over vanity, right? This might look like going deeper rather than wider. It's really easy to want to be everywhere all at once, but when you do that, you're also spread pretty thin. You're like a pancake versus going deeper rather than wider, right? They say the riches are in the niches. This also looks like quality content over quantitative content. Again, this is all stuff that is so much easier said than done, but it is one of the few things that I am able to offer that combats a challenge like this. Another idea that I have is something that is more within people's control, which is establishing boundaries with yourself. I I grew up with social media. I was a young high schooler when I got involved in Instagram, when Twitter became a thing, right? And there were so, there were so many less boundaries with that kind of thing. People didn't know how to talk about it. Our parents didn't know how to talk about, you know, healthy boundaries with social media because they didn't grow up with it. It moves so quickly. It's so hard to keep up with. So we're constantly teaching ourselves, right? We're constantly writing one wave or another. But if this creator economy, this, this attention economy, this branded economy, whatever you want to call it, if it is a job and you are being an entrepreneur, you are allowed to set boundaries with it just like you would in any other workplace. You check your emails at certain times, you answer phone calls at certain times, albeit it is very hard to do that. When you're an entrepreneur, I am known for rotting on my couch at eight o'clock with my laptop open, doing something work-related. I'm not perfect at it either, but I am trying, right? Set limits with yourself. Lock yourself out of your Instagram account. I do that. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Organizing your days. I assign themes to every single one of my days in Google Calendar over, otherwise it gets overwhelming. There are project management tools for all of the little things that you have to do and feel like you need to do them all at once. Use Trello, it's free. I love it. This isn't sponsored. I just, I use Trello a lot and it's easy and it's cheap and it's free. And lastly, I think one of the most important suggestions that I have is valuing community over competition. The fastest way to grow while also supporting other people who might be in similar spots as you is cross promotion, right? Who do you know of who's trying to do the same thing as you? Does it make sense? What, what kind of overlap do the two of you have that could maybe turn out to be a win-win scenario? Maybe this looks like support groups and just having meetups, right? Meetup.com, eventbrite.com. There's a couple different websites on there that host like online events for creatives, for content creators. There's also a event happening in Chicago this February that I'm going to be at. This is just a quick self-promotive plug, okay, because this is a self-promotion video. I have to practice that and get better at it myself because it's a little bit unavoidable, but this is an event happening in February in Chicago meant for creative entrepreneurs, for publishers, for writers, for artists, for photographers, for videographers, for coaches, for, I don't know, any, if, if you identify as a creative entrepreneur, this is a community that is all about support, that is all about culture, that's all about connection and collaboration and it's happening this February at the Intercontinental Hotel in Chicago. Like I said, I'm going to be there giving a workshop saying hi to some people, but it is a really, really cool, exciting event. And I just don't know of many others that are around that do that kind of thing. So definitely consider checking it out. Information is going to be down below, but this is all I have for this video. I hope you found it interesting and you got something out of it. If you have thoughts that you'd like to share, please feel free to do them down below. I don't want this to be a one-sided conversation. If you have thoughts that differ from mine, even more of a reason to share them. So I hope you got something out of this video. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing. Helps other people discover the channel. If you liked it, it means someone else is gonna like it too. Um, that's all I have. I'll see you in the next video. Take care until then, okay? See you later, bye.